the market for phone controllers is not very dynamic, especially the telescopic ones. Although we have seen many reviews in the recent months, all were updates to existing ones. That's why it's rare when a new player appears, even more if it promises all the features for a lower price. So when the Shax S5B came along, I dismissed it as another Chinese option, but I was very wrong. It's a very different controller, with so many features, the competition might want to worry. So let's see if it's a real deal or just tempy promises. Welcome back, I'm Claudio and this is zero to tech Shax is a Korean company that appeared out of nowhere. Although they have other controllers before, chances are that you, like me, have never heard of them. At least not until they released the S5B, and I wasn't going to review it, but a subscriber told me it was a great surprise, so I decided to take the plunge. The controller comes in a regular cardboard box, without many drawings or information. When we open it, we see it comes stored in a case, which does its job. Additionally, we only have the manual. We open the zipper to take out the controller, which looks pretty good, and we have a couple of accessories a second cap for the D-pad, and a simple USB-A to USB-C cable. Closed, the controller has a design like almost any other one. The only thing that betrays its nature is the line that separates the two parts, which you pull apart to reveal the telescopic mechanism. It is made in three pieces, it does not open as smoothly, you can feel the friction between the pieces, but they are completely hidden when closed. We can see the logo in the center when we open it all the way, and it's not a big controller. It's comparable to the original version of the Razer Kishi, but feels more portable. And it can be used closed without doing weird things because it has Bluetooth. But you can also use it wired. They try to be truly universal, with support for Android, Windows, Mac and iOS. This is thanks to the fact that it supports direct input and X input. It also has an additional Android mapping mode, you can change them using this switch. So far so good. When you open it to put the phone, you notice what is different from the competition. It is much wider. Instead of mimicking a portable console like the Vita or the Switch, with the slimmer controllers on the sides, here they went all out and are so far from the screen that they look weird. But this is not bad. They bet on ergonomics and they did it very well. The handles have a clear place to put your fingers. And everything is accessible. Supposedly, it fits phones up to 165mm, but we tried the Red Magic 7S Pro which measures almost 167 and it fits perfectly. The Poco F2 even fits with a cover. It has two legs on the back to try not to touch the cameras. Where the phone sits on the controller, it has soft rubber to avoid scratches, although it does not have the perforations to let the sound out. But since they have a diagonal shape, it does not cover them completely. In the lower part, there is a limit so the phone won't slip, but at the top, there is no limit. When set, it dances a little, but stays in its position. The phone rests in a slightly higher position, which works quite well. It is not licensed, but the front buttons have the official Xbox layout and colors. In addition, we have a power button, which once connected works as a menu button, one function button, and the two under the specific buttons, home and back, and the pairing button below. All this is intended to work with the app on Android, which has a lot of functionality. For example, you can update the controller's firmware, remap all the buttons, change the time for the controller to suspend, the brightness of the LEDs, recalibrate the analog sticks and buttons, and even change the name of the gamepad, which you will see how useful it is later in the video. Within all this, there are two exciting features. The first one is to activate the vibration when pressing specific buttons. <laughs> yes, the controller supports vibration. But since support is broken on Android, you can set it to vibrate with any button press. It doesn't make much sense on most buttons, but the analog ones, it vibrates more the more you press, which gives you a better feedback when using them. The second one is configuring both the function button and the back button to activate one of the many functionalities, like activating a virtual mouse, starting the turbo button, activating sniper mode, which lowers the stick sensibility when pressed, screen capture and more. With the option of having two, you will find something you like. Finally, the software also includes the mapping functionality for all those games without support. To use it, we first need to pair it in mapping mode, then launch the app, add the game, give permissions, etc. 
we were able to play Call of Duty, we just had to adjust the configuration for it to work, because the native settings were too weird. The last trick is the ability to change the name of the controller. It doesn't sound like much, but this is how many apps limit their compatibility. Here, we can go to the app, then to name change, and we select the Xbox wireless controller option. You have to repair it, but then you can use it with native support in games like Call of Duty Mobile and Apex Legends. A surprise is that the software is ad-supported, not too intrusive, the typical top banner. I don't think it's a bad idea to help support the app, better than try to charge an annual subscription to use it. With all this added functionality, the Shack S5B tries to go much farther than its competition, and do it well. Merely changing the name of the controller, it's a simple solution to an annoying problem with many games. But let's now go to the most important part, how good it is as a controller. We start with the sticks that do not look like much. They are slightly concave, but do not have any texture to improve grip apart from the little marks on the corners that are more ornamented than function. Its plastic feels a bit cheap, but the treble is long and smooth, but feels mechanical when changing direction, and there are angles when pressing the lever is almost impossible. With Gamepad Tester, we see that they do not have a dead zone in the lower part, and that the progression is linear, but there is a big dead zone in the upper part, it's not ideal, and calibrating the sticks didn't change anything, but it's no problem to fill the test block. There are no jumps and it's very controllable. The corners are not rounded as they should be, which I did not expect. You can push all the way to the corner, which we already know it's not ideal. We started the test with Apex Legends, and thanks to the name change, we can use it natively. In general, it worked pretty well. You can control the movement and aim with no issues. But the saturation problem requires you to be more careful when adjusting the pressure. It's basically the same as if you were playing with smaller sticks. The next was Fortnite and the same. All medium and deep adjustment moves are fine, but minor adjustments or keeping the aim on the big teams is not that easy. More if you're trying to target with Sniper. At least, the Sniper Feeder helps to lower the sensitivity when you need it, similar to a mouse with different DPIs. The analog buttons initially feel good, although their movement is weird. We have never seen one like this. They touch the edges and you can feel the scratch when pressed but they are soft and have a good throw. The problem is that the trouble is only physical. Like the sticks, they have a big dead zone at the end, and this affects when playing car games. We can modulate the acceleration and brakes, but again, you must be very careful while pressing them, because past the middle, you are already at full saturation. And that, added to the sticks, makes games like Rush Rally more complicated than they have to be. I wanted to accelerate slowly, going out of the corners, but suddenly, I was at full throttle and went out of the road. In Forza Horizon 5, it didn't work well too. Although the analog regulation exists, there is no way to use it other than playing for many hours to get used to, which is never an excuse for a controller. It's as if the designer said, it came out like that because we were drunk. <laughs> but again, it is not an excuse. If they made it then, with a lot of trouble, they should have worked on the dead zone. So the analog sticks and the buttons, while available, <laughs> aren't great. They have the dead zone problem, and between that and the smaller sticks or buttons with less trouble, <laughs> I prefer less trouble. It doesn't give you the wrong idea of what the controller can do, which can make you lose control. The front buttons have a nice design. As we mentioned, they have the colors and the layout of the Xbox controller. They are transparent with letters in the background, similar to the DualSense. In truth, they look perfect. When pressed, they have very little trouble and good tactile feel. They even make a little noise. The only detail is that they are stiffer than usual. Above, L1 and R1 have a very similar feel but not so rigid. The select and the start buttons are in different positions on each side, but both are close at hand, with no other buttons to confuse them. And like the rest of the function buttons, they are a little hard to press and have a distinct clicking noise. The power buttons also work as a menu button, but only in Android mode. We now turn to the D-Path, and there is much to talk about. Shaxx again tried to go beyond the bare minimum, including a D-Path with two different caps. The first is a cross, similar to a normal D-Path, and the second one is a concave circle. The idea is similar to the D-Path of the Elite 2, but it is definitely just the idea. <laughs> Not only because they are made of plastic, 
but because the feel of the D-pad is terrible. It makes noise when pressed, but the main problem is that it requires more pressure than expected, and this impacts its use. In precision tests, it works fine. With both caps, it's possible to mix directions, but since it has almost no pivot, it's tough. You won't do it by accident, but the same hardness makes it difficult to do diagonals. And although this type of test is usually easier with the cross, here the circle caps works better because its size helps doing a lever, which lightens the pressure. Where it is a disaster is in the sequence test. In general, each D-pad has its trick, which you must get used to, but this has been one of the most difficult. First, I didn't get used to the feel and timing, I couldn't perform the special moves consistently. Then, when I thought I got it, I tried the move and boom, nothing. <laughs> it's even more complicated because for some reason, the diagonals to the left are softer than the ones to the right. I actually thought that the problem was latency, so I decided to also do the test connected with USB. For it to work wired, it must be in Android or Windows mode. Then, with the controller off, you must press and hold the Bluetooth button and without releasing it, connect the controller to the phone. But the lag is not a problem. It works the same, so the problem is not timing, it is the transition to diagonals. This is no problem for games that use the sticks and only use the D-pad as additional buttons. But if you want it for retro games, it might work for action games, but not for fighting games. Now, let's quickly try it in other platforms, where there is good news. Starting with iOS, where the controller worked quite well. I thought the iPhone mode would use the discontinued iK, like all those other Chinese controllers. <laughs> but no, it uses XE input too. And it even stores the device separately so you can pair it with two. And it works perfectly. We tested it with Genshin Impact with no problem. It feels great. We also tried it with Halo Infinite on xCloud. While the sticks aren't ideal, if you're looking for a cheap iOS controller, this is a good option. The next thing was to test it on Windows, and good news too. It is a matter of using X input for it to work in all games. It had no problems with games from the Epic Store, Xbox or xCloud. And it works wired if you want to have no latency. A significant difference from the rest of the telescopic controllers. The circularity test of these sticks is terrible. With more than 21% error, which shows there was no attempt at circularity, it is no exaggeration. This harm games. This is way to see it is in the N64 controller test, which draws a line far from the ideal one. And you see it in games like Mario 64, where you don't even get to the corner and it's already running flat out. About the price, it is not an easy controller to find. The easiest thing is to Google to see whether it is available. In my case, I bought it for $60, which is its typical price. And for the price, I think it barely competes. It has issues with analog sticks and buttons, and the awful D path. But it has many extra features like function buttons, sniper mode, controller rename, wired mode, vibration, and even a mapping mode. In summary, the Shax S5B is a controller that tries to beat its price, with extras that you don't usually expect in this type of controller. It offers significant value for those looking for a universal controller, but with the comfort of the telescopic mechanism for the phone. A good option from a company that is just starting, but shows a promising future. If you want a similar option, check out the comparison between the Game Series X2 and the Razer Kishi. And if you liked the video, don't forget to like and subscribe. Remember, retro games, modern technology, zero to tech.